Hello and welcome to Within the Frame, where we bring today's most pressing global issues into focus. I'm Kim mo -gyan. Republican candidate and former President Donald Trump is set to return to the White House for a historic second term, becoming America's 47th president. The news came about an hour ago with major news outlets reporting that Trump swept at least 277 electoral votes by winning Wisconsin, the same state that put him over the top back in 2016. In a speech at his camp headquarters, Trump declared victory and vowed to heal the country, fight for the security as well as prosperity of America. Trump now becomes the oldest president ever elected in the U.S. at 78. He would also be the first defeated president in 132 years to win another term for the White House. For the latest on this, we first connect to our go-to Voice of America correspondent, Jessica Stone in Washington. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Hey, great to be with you again. Thank you for coming on. Jessica, it's just been uh, more than a day or so since Election Day, and we already have a winner at this point. <clears throat> As opposed to our expectations, it was quite a surprise to see Trump with such a clear lead very fast. Was there any change in voting patterns? How could we read into these elections? There definitely were some changes in voting patterns, and I want to raise a couple of them. Pretty interesting uh, results. Uh, in fact, we saw a greater turnout from uh, non-college educated voters. We saw um, a greater turnout from Black and Hispanic voters, particularly Latino men. Fewer than half of them voted for Harris, according to exit polls. That is the first time that a, ma a majority Latino men did not vote Democratic in the last five elections. So 54% of Latino men going for Trump. Also, as I mentioned, this gap in education, Trump uh, winning more than half of those who do not have university educations. As we've been talking about, we are starting to see some indications that there is a switching of classes between these two parties. Traditionally, we saw the Democrats as being a very pro-union, pro-working man party. We're now seeing more of those voters go to the Trump-led party uh, they are responding to the messages about trade, in particular trade uh, and exporting of jobs over to Asia. They are responding to his messages about forever wars and needing to reduce the amount of foreign entanglements and conflicts that the United States is involved in. So we are seeing a, a pretty interesting shift in the American electorate uh, based on some of those exit polling and some trends that we're looking at. Right. Then, Jessica, what about the candidates? Uh, how are they taking the situation? Hours ago, we are aware that Trump delivered a speech. He pledged to, quote, heal the country. What could we expect for the president-elect to focus on as when he takes office? Well, he literally said in that acceptance speech or that self-proclaimed acceptance <laughs> speech that he was going to basically make good on the promises he made on the campaign trail. He said repeatedly, she broke it, I'll fix it. He intends to work on the economy. He has pledged to implement those high tariffs on foreign trade. Uh, he has definitely pledged to uh, the, engage in mass deportation so that uh, the border issue is, uh, as he would put it, fixed. I mean, he talks in very simple terms about how he's going to address these problems, but he's also talked in some, uh, at least detail, about what he's going to do on deportations, mass deportations. We'll have to see what the law allows, what Congress allows, but keep in mind, it looks as though the Republicans will, will also maintain control of the House and Senate. They already have the House. They won the Senate. That means there is a mandate for not divided government, but Republican-led government and these policies that have been proposed by their leader, Donald Trump. Right. So we're going to see more of a uh, America First policy that's gotten stronger. Now that votes have been counted already and we already have a winner, um, Jessica, what are the next steps? When does the president-elect's term officially begin? Well, he would be inaugurated on January 20th, 2025. So that's uh, over a month from now. We uh, absolutely have to finish the count. They have to certify the vote. Uh, and um, this administration, the Trump administration, needs to pick its cabinet. Now, one thing that's in their favor about getting that cabinet confirmed, so these are the secretaries of state, defense, commerce, treasury, et cetera, uh, with, a, with a Republican Senate, it is much more likely that they will be confirmed, which will smooth the path to uh, <clears throat> the presidency being a, a smoother transition. I remember covering the early days of the Trump administration, and it was so chaotic because they never expected to win. Well, now not only did they have a much more confidence going into this election, thinking they would win, they also have Project 2025, which, like it or not, is a transition project. 
It, it is something that, pr that President Trump tried to distance himself from on the campaign, but it, it, was, it was also an effort to put, a, get, put together large databases of people who could serve in a potential Trump administration, uh, and it will speed up the transition if, in fact, it's employed, uh, because there, it simply just didn't exist during the last Trump transition. All right, uh, Jessica, thank you so much for your contributions to our election coverage. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Always great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And now that we know who will become America's next leader, let's look into the current situation and gauge the impact of the election on the Korean Peninsula. For this, we are joined in the studio by Mason Rishi, a professor of international politics at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Welcome, Professor. Great. Thanks for having me. So first, I must ask, Professor, did you expect the results to be out this fast? <laughs> um, actually, I did. You know, I, I had a number of meetings with uh, um, international officials uh, the last you know week or ten days, where you know obviously the election was something we talked about, and I uh, actually did uh, kind of expect that. Um, you know, also with uh, you know diplomats and other people here in, in various uh, scenarios. So I actually, kind of did uh, have a feeling that maybe this was going to be clearer than we expected, and in part that was because you know we were over the last two to three weeks beginning to see evidence that whoever won was likely to run the table or come close to running the table in these battleground states, and so it was less likely that uh, you would have a situation like you had uh, in 2020, where you had one or two states uh, whose uh, final electoral account uh, was going to potentially be decisive. Uh, and indeed, that's exactly what happened. It looks like Trump is going to more or less uh, run the table. We'll have to finish counting the votes in the few places where they're not done yet. But uh, no, I'm not actually surprised that we uh, knew this already. Right. Now that we have the outcome of the U.S. elections, and we believe it's going to have significant ramifications to um, many things, especially here in South Korea for the security situation here, uh, we are aware that Trump is not really happy with the current uh, defense cost-sharing deal with South Korea. Professor, what kind of changes could we expect during his second term? Sure. So, you know, just to begin with the cost-sharing uh, deal, which you mentioned, uh, the host nation support that South Korea provides uh, for the stationing uh, of U.S. Uh, troops and, and equipment uh, on South Korean territory. This is known as the Special Measures Agreement. Uh, in the first Trump uh, term, uh, he put tremendous pressure uh, on South Korea to dramatically increase uh, South Korea's cost for the SMA. Uh, South Korea pushed back in a negotiation process which was drawn out over time and was a significant source of friction between Seoul and Washington. Uh, eventually, South Korea did end up paying more. Uh, when Joe Biden uh, came in, uh, you know, that negotiation process uh, returned much more to a, a normal framework. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Biden administration and the UN administration have worked uh, over the last year or so to renegotiate the SMA uh, so that it's already going to be uh, done for 2025. Um, but that doesn't mean that Trump is necessarily going to uh, live with the results of, of that agreement. You know, he's already indicated that he's unhappy with it, and I think, frankly, there's a, a pretty good chance that he's going to want to renegotiate it. Uh, the question, I think, will be, you know, what kind of leverage does South Korea have to push back uh, against those demands? Uh, South Korea has a, you know, become a much more important country. Uh, it's obviously important regionally here, uh, and it's important for the larger effort that uh, the, the U.S. wants to make in terms of containing China. Uh, so I think you know, South Korea has some tools, but I think it's going to have to get ready for a pretty rough uh, renegotiation attempt by the Trump administration. Right, so we'll have to ramp up for those uh, new discussions. Now, regarding North Korea, Professor, uh, Trump has consistently stressed his you know, ties with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and his willingness to engage in dialogue with the regime. How do you see South Korea's uh, North Korean policy being uh, impacted, especially regarding pressure and pressure and sanctions? Yeah, so, you know, the short answer to that is buckle up. Uh, you know, the first time around Trump uh, you know, had a, a you know, wildly disparate uh, set of ways of dealing with North Korea. Uh, as we remember, you know, when Trump came into office uh, relatively quickly, we moved into the phase of, you know, what 
became known as Fire and Fury, where North Korea uh, and the United States, or, or Kim and Trump, uh, you know, traded rhetorical barbs uh, back and forth regarding uh, you know, potential use of nuclear weapons against each other. Uh, this uh, eventually found a denouement uh, in 2018 with the Pyeongchang Olympics and the beginning of a, you know, a pendulum swing to the other side, where uh, Trump and Kim uh, held a number of summits. Uh, they ended up uh, not working out with a massive failure uh, in Hanoi. Uh, and you know, the, I think that sort of variance in Trump's approach towards North Korea is likely that something that we're going to, to see again. Uh, I think uh, this is going to put, uh, in some respects, South Korea potentially in a difficult position. So you know, if diplomacy starts with uh, North Korea, uh, unlike the first time around, uh, the UN administration, which is conservative, is, is going to be uh, largely, I think, unhappy uh, with that type of diplomatic approach, uh, especially if denuclearization isn't on the table, which is very likely to be the case if these talks were to happen at all. Uh, that was not the case the first time around when Moon Jae-in was president and largely in some respects uh, you know, supported this type of diplomatic effort on, on the part of the United States because they thought it served South Korea's uh, interests in terms of rapprochement with, with, uh, with North Korea. Uh, so, you know, that might cause a problem for the UN administration. On the other hand, you know, Donald Trump doesn't give anything away for free. Uh, he is, you know, ultimately a conservative uh, Republican, and he does have a, you know, very robust sense of, you know, U.S. power. Uh, and so there's a, a part of Trump's, you know, overall defense and security philosophy, which is based around peace, uh, peace through strength, uh, which I think is, is in some sense consonant with what the UN administration would want. So I think that the main thing we should prepare for is some very wild uh, gyrations uh, and how the U.S. Uh, approaches North Korea. Right, and those include sanctions. Yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, I don't think you know Trump t will give anything away for free, right? So you know, his first you know time around, he referred to you know his policy towards North Korea as you know maximum pressure, and that included a significant uh, component uh, of sanctions. Uh, now, of course, we're in a wildly different environment now internationally with respect to how functional sanctions are, largely because of uh, China's uh, uh, refusal to uh, to enforce those sanctions, and especially uh, the Russia and North. Korea relationship, uh, which is a you know, very direct undermining of the sanctions regime. You know, but if, if the Trump administration were to want to take sanctions uh, off of North Korea in some form or another, he would certainly want to extract a price for that. He gives nothing away for free. Uh, so I don't think he's going to come in and you know, simply decide, okay, you know, the United States is going to stop trying to you know, monitor and, and, and enforce sanctions. So I don't think that's the first thing that the UN administration should have to worry about. Right. Now, you've mentioned Trump is not a person who gives anything out for free. Uh, so this transactional approach of Trump, do you think this could lead to um, bold deals with South Korea, like uh, potential redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons in the land here? Um, how likely do you think such a scenario is? So just on the, the question of tactical nuclear weapons, you know, I know that there are a number of uh, conservative uh, South Korean politicians uh, you know, who advocate this. Uh, and you know, I think the U.S. military at least largely finds this to be unnecessary uh, and you know, in some sense even problematic. Uh, and I think you know, really the, the issue is not U.S. capabilities, right? The U.S. capability to uh, provide extended nuclear deterrence uh, for South Korea, uh, or you know, as they sometimes call it, you know, integrated deterrence that involves both the U.S. extended nuclear deterrence with you know, South Korea's own conventional deterrence capabilities. You know, that's not in question. You know, I think from the South Korean perspective, the thing that's considered worrisome is the political commitment that, that Trump would have uh, to defending South Korea in uh, the case of a nuclear crisis. Uh, so just putting tactical nuclear weapons here, I think, isn't, isn't really going to solve the problem. You know, it, I, I can't exclude that as something that, that might happen. It might be something that you know, the conservatives here in Korea might be able to get from the Trump administration. Uh, and perhaps the administration here you know, in, in Washington would be willing to do that. What it is that they would want in return, I'm not sure. I do think that we are likely to see you know, attempts by the US you know, under Trump to make big deals with South Korea in, in various forms. One of them I could imagine, for instance, would be uh, the Trump administration trying to repurpose in some form or another uh, U.S. Forces Korea, so USFK, uh, those soldiers that are stationed here, and those assets that are stationed here to be more flexibly postured so that they could be more easily used uh, from South Korea in the case of, for instance, a contingency or a crisis in the Taiwan Strait. This would put South Korea, I think, in a sort of a difficult position because obviously, you know, not only might those assets be used for 
uh, protection for a place other than South Korea, uh, but obviously that would put South Korea in a difficult position vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, you know, you know, what would South Korea want in return for that? You know, that might be a part of a, a large package deal. Um, we don't know, you know what that might be. But yeah, we can imagine that the Trump administration is going to have, you know, different chess pieces that it's moving around in different combinations. And, you know, South Korea is going to, you know, have to prepare itself for that and perhaps be willing to be more risk tolerant in terms of the types of deals that it makes with the Trump administration than it has to be under Biden. Right. So we have to brace for impact. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Buckle up. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Professor, North Korea, for the case of North Korea, North Korea launched the ballistic missile just six hours before the U.S. presidential election kicked off. What do you think prompted this timing and what kind of message do they want to send? Yeah, so, you know, I'm usually on the record uh, almost every time I'm asked about a North Korean uh, missile launch of one variety or another, uh, saying that you know, North Korea almost always has multiple reasons for why it is that it carries out missile launches. Uh, sometimes it's for demonstration, sometimes it's for a domestic political uh, message, sometimes it's for an international political message, sometimes it's for testing, sometimes it's for you know, exercise practice for its troops, and frequently it's some or all of those. Uh, in this particular case, you know, I'm going to do something which I don't usually do and say I think that there's really a, 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 a point here in which this is really more about messaging than it is anything else. These were short-range uh, ballistic missiles, you know, so there, I think there's a demonstration, you know, effect there, uh, you know, perhaps the use value of, you know, in, in training their troops to be able to, to you know, shoot these volleys off. Uh, uh, in a coordinated fashion, but you know, clearly the fact that this took place shortly before the U.S. election uh, is a message to whichever incoming administration <laughs> it would be, uh, and also a message uh, to the UN administration that you know, North Korea is still here. Uh, North Korea you know, remains uh, aggressive and ready to deter uh, you know, any potential attack you know, by, by the U.S. Uh, or South Korea or, or the combination of those two. Uh, and, you know, that denuclearization isn't on the table, right, and that it's, you know, underlining the fact that it's not going to give up its nuclear weapons. Now, we are not really sure about what North Korea really wants, but I want to ask this question. Do you think North Korea um, wanted, uh, is more happy to see Trump return? Yeah, that's a, a hard question, <laughs> and, and, you know, here I'm clearly in the realm of pure speculation. I, I, I don't know, and I, I don't have any access mm -hmm. uh, into Kim Jong-un's uh, head, probably, thankfully. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm really of two minds on this, and I think maybe a lot of people are. You know, on the one hand, a Trump administration uh, offers uh, some possibilities that a Biden administration and a Harris administration don't offer. Uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, you know, they've taken a very, you know, incremental um, approach that's been focused almost entirely on deterrence through, you know, working with South Korea and especially working with South Korea and Japan in a trilateral context. Uh, and essentially they've, you know, you know, I won't say they've abandoned, but they've, you know, clearly deprioritized um, an aggressive diplomatic outreach, you know, perhaps for good reason. Um, and that, of course, means that you know North Korea, in some sense, you know, finds itself you know relatively cornered, at least in terms of its relationship you know with the United States. It's, it's found a solution to that, which is through better relations, notably with Russia. Um, but nonetheless, that that avenue of possibility has largely been closed off. Trump, of course, is more risk tolerant with the type of relations that he's willing to have with dictators like Kim Jong Un and, and rogue states like North Korea. So it opens up some some possibilities. On the other hand, Trump has. Uh, broadcast that he's very likely to reduce uh, and perhaps over time even eliminate support for Ukraine. Uh, and if he does that, it's going to be very difficult for Ukraine to continue the fight against Russia, which means there might be and probably likely would be a faster end to that war, uh, unfortunately to the detriment of Ukraine, I think, than would be the case if Harris were to come in. And that means that Russia would wind down um, its, uh, its activities there, the, the kinetic hostilities, which would make it less uh, reliant and less likely to work with North Korea uh, in terms of either procuring uh, artillery and and, and missiles uh, or using the troops that North Korea has sent there, which North Korea is getting a lot of money for uh, and presumably also military technology. And if that uh, rationale for the relationship uh, from, a North, from a Russian perspective is no longer there, then North Korea you know, may find that its burgeoning relationship with Russia uh, won't be as lucrative uh, as, it, as it might be otherwise. And so in that sense, I think they, they perhaps are, are a little bit worried, at least if they're thinking strategically about how those um, elements are connected. Uh, so I, you know, I think uh, in some respects, yeah, I'm, I'm of two minds on this.
Right. Thank you for clarifying on both sides. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, Professor, uh, now that Trump is expect is will return, South Korea will need a strategy to address potential security risks on the Korean Peninsula. What do you think should the government be doing to prepare? I mean, I think the first thing uh, is that South Korea you know, needs to be prepared for the overall relationship with the United States. Uh, at least in terms of you know security and defense on the Korean Peninsula to to fall even further into the the context of the U.S. relationship with China, uh, and you know the the Trump administration you know the last time around you know was already making that the case. The Biden administration you know has sort of continued that in some respects, um, but you know the Trump administration you know 2.0 is going to have a lot of advisors around Trump who are extremely interested uh, in in focusing in, in an even more laser-like fashion on China. So the U.S.-South Korea alliance, I think, is even more so than before going to be subordinated uh, to, the, to the relationship between Washington and Beijing. And that's going to potentially cause some, some difficulties for South Korea, both directly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Beijing, but also uh, in terms of uh, deterrence and, and the overall posture towards North Korea. So I think that's one thing. I think the, 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 sol the solution to that, or you know, a part of the solution to that, is going to be for Seoul to do uh, even more work than it has already done to improve relations uh, with Japan. Uh, that's taken place so far largely in a trilateral context with the United States. How involved the Trump administration is going to be in pushing forward that trilateral relationship is unknown, but I don't think that that relationship is simply going to, to fall apart. Uh, but I think that you know, South Korea and also Japan are going to have to have you know, even more uh, improved bilateral relations. And I think that's one way of beginning to sort of you know, uh, provide some, some prophylactic against some potential um, uh, uh, disruptions by, by the Trump administration. And then also economic security, right? You know, supply chains, uh, you know, minerals, uh, you know, inputs into you know, high-tech uh, you know, industry. You know, those are also related to security and defense. And I think we can expect a ramping up uh, of, uh, of U.S. pressure under Trump 2.0 uh, in that respect as well. Again, largely as a part of a you know, China defense and security containment effort. And you know, South Korea is going to be pulled into that uh, even more so than it already is under the Biden administration. So I think those are three areas we could name more, but we don't have all nine. So. <laughs> right. So we have a lot of challenges ahead. Now, uh, what about in the case of relationship with uh, the South Korea and U.S.? What do you think is the biggest challenge that we have to manage? Yeah, so as I just said, I, I think the biggest challenge in some form is you know, simply the fact that the South Korea-U.S. alliance uh, is going to be subordinated even more than it has already uh, been to, to the China relationship, and that you know, potentially causes some, some friction points. Uh, I think uh, the, the next, uh, or the, the second thing, I think, is you know, what South Korea uh, should think in terms of the, the credibility of uh, deterrence against North Korea. Part of that is, of course, you know, again, the, the relationship with China. Part of that is you know, Trump's own uh, rhetorical stance on uh, extended deterrence uh, for other countries and alliances um, in general. Uh, and so that opens up a number of possibilities, uh, and, but also some risks. Uh, you know, if deterrence uh, you know, erodes because of uh, Trump's lack of political commitment or perceived lack of political commitment, that represents a risk for South Korea. Um, on the other hand, the Trump administration has also shown, um, you know, or Trump administration 2.0 has shown potentially more interest in South Korea uh, going some steps farther towards developing its own nuclear weapons, which is something that uh, obviously uh, some in the South Korean uh, conservative side of the political uh, divide are, are interested in. So I think that's something. Um, and then, of course, again, with North Korea, you know, Trump is likely at some point to, again, you know, start up the, the negotiation process uh, with Kim, and, and that's going to carry some pretty severe risks uh, if Trump makes a deal that is uh, likely to undermine South Korea's security, for instance, through some type of you know, arms control that allows North Korea to keep uh, its uh, nuclear weapons uh, or some part of its nuclear weapons uh, in nuclear program. Uh, you know, that would be something that would be a, a huge you know, shock here uh, mm -hmm. to South Korea and, and would require a, a you know, very complex response. Right. Uh, Professor Rishi, I'm afraid we'll have to leave our discussion right here. We're running out of time. Thank you so much for your insights tonight. Right, thanks for having me.
Thank you for joining us on Within the Frame. Be sure to tune in again next time as we continue to explore the stories that matter. Until then, stay informed and engaged.